Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. One of the long-running themes of the show has been the idea that during a realignment of American politics, the left and the right respectively are going to reimagine their economic programs to confront a different America and try to win votes in the middle and working classes. So over the coming weeks, we're going to focus on those left and right sides of these debates. Today's episode is with journalist Michael Tomasky. He has a new book out. It's called The Middle Out. The Rise of Progressive Economics, and really looks at these debates on the progressive left and helps us give a bit of a coherent look at how the Biden administration is approaching these issues, as once again, they are debated within think tanks, organizing at a political level, and of course, within the Biden administration itself. In the coming weeks, we're going to do the same exact topic from the right. Would love some suggestions for who folks think we should talk to. Of course, I'm thinking of going back to the American Compass guys because they always have something valuable to add, but would love any suggestions on the Substack or anywhere else there. If you enjoy this episode and this kind of mini series I'm doing here, we'd love for you to go to realignment.supercast.com. Once again, that's realignment.supercast.com, or you can find the link in your show notes. Hope you all enjoy this episode, and a huge thank you to Lincoln Network, the episode's sponsor. Here we go. Michael Tomaski, welcome to The Realignment. Marshall, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to chat with you. It's It's funny. I've been kind of harping on this idea that I should have more podcasts dedicated to solutions and advancement as opposed to just complaining about the state of the country. So this is the perfect booking for that. Now, having said that, I would like you to sort of set the stage by diagnosing what you see as the sort of central economic set of challenges and problems facing the country right now. And then we'll get into how progressive economics slash middle out economics is the proper response to that situation slash diagnosis. Sure. Uh, the central problem is a really simple one. Uh, the transfer of trillions of dollars of wealth from working and middle class people to the top, not only 1%, but the top 0.1% and the top 0.01%. Uh, there's a RAND study that I cite in the book from 2020. Uh, and they looked at this from 1978 through 2018, 50 years. Uh, and they looked at how economic policies had changed, how the tax structure had changed, uh, a whole bunch of things, and concluded that $50 trillion of wealth had been transferred from the middle class to the top in that in that 50-year period. Uh, uh, that's a staggering number, but here's a number that's more comprehensible to people. In 2018, the median individual income, not household income, but individual income, was something around $36,000. If all that wealth had not been transferred and, and, and our policies had been what they were in 1978 and, and money had been distributed in 2018 as it was in 1978, that median individual income would have been closer to $56,000. So we live in an economy, Marshall, when even when it's doing well, quote unquote, you know, when the market's doing well and when wages are going up and unemployment is low, even when it's doing well, this transfer of wealth is still churning away and and the rich are still pulling away and the very rich are pulling away from the rich so this is what we need to reverse this is what we need to change uh we've been through uh you know i use the phrase in the book economic paradigm broadly speaking we've been through three in this country's history from the founding up through the stock market crash and the Great Depression. And, and we can call that the, the Smithian paradigm after Adam Smith and the, and the laissez-faire uh, uh, principles that, that governed economic policymaking in that time. Uh, then the uh, crash happened and then Roosevelt was elected. We had the New Deal and then we entered the Keynesian paradigm from the 1930s through the mid-1970s. John Maynard Keynes, I refer to, of course, and and the policies of, of uh, government intervention in the economy for the purposes of creating more demand and, and uh, creating more employment. Then there were some crises in the 70s, the OPEC crisis, uh, inflation, and Keynesianism lost its footing. And now we've been in the Friedman paradigm, the neoliberal free market paradigm, cut taxes, cut regulations, uh, the rising tide will lift all boats kind of stuff. That, by rights, should have ended after the Great Recession, but it didn't really. And we can get into why if you want to. But uh, the point of the book is, or one of the points of the book is, it's time for a fourth paradigm. So here's a 
question then maybe i've been captured by neoliberal philosophical assumptions but could you explain to me how this transfer of wealth from the bottom in the middle to the rich would work because as i would understand the history since let's say i was born 1992 you have the internet, you have technology, you have globalization. It makes it so that the persons at the top are able to benefit from that change. Jeff Bezos is able to become incredibly, incredibly wealthy. And we could debate whether or not he should have been paying a higher level of taxes on that wealth, whether that wealth should have been distributed better. But I don't see Jeff Bezos as stealing that from anyone on the lower and middle side. So these are just like my assumptions reaction. So yeah. can you like articulate that story? Um, maybe in why you think I'd be wrong to think about it that way. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's a good question. I, I, I'm not Marxist enough to call it theft exactly, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, a Marxist wouldn't call it theft. Um, but you know, a lot of new wealth was created by some of the economic activities you, you mentioned, the, the internet and stuff. It, it, it created money that just didn't exist before. Uh, but there are a lot of policy decisions and laws and changes in culture and custom that have shifted a lot of that money from the middle to the top. Uh, you know, it, tax tax law obviously has really has really you know had a significant effect on this. I mean, you know, the top marginal rate uh, when Ronald Reagan took office was um, around seventy five percent. Uh, and now it's just under 40%. So, you know, that's rich people keeping a whole lot more of their money. Now, you could say that 75 is too high. It probably was uh, or would be today. Uh, I'd put it somewhere in between 40 and 75, the top marginal rate. Uh, but, you know, that's that's a billions and billions and billions of dollars that people at the very top got to keep. In terms of custom and culture, uh, this was a big change that um, Milton Friedman, again, had a big hand in by writing in 1970 in the New York Times magazine that this whole idea that corporations have any responsibility to communities or what we call stakeholders is nonsense, is pernicious socialist nonsense, and their only responsibility is to their shareholders. And boy, that's what corporations wanted to hear. So that shifted thinking uh, dramatically in corporate America. And, you know, that's when, you know, the, the Rust Belt became a thing. I'm not saying that's all Milton Friedman's fault, but, you know, jobs shifted, you know, to low wage countries and CEOs started making not 20 or 50 times what their average employee was making, which was the case before all this, but 300, 320, 350 times what their average employee makes. So those are some of the reasons. I'm curious here, you have this funny line in the book, I think in the first chapter where you point out that in terms of these terms, these titles, conservatism has an advantage in that you hear the word conservatism and you could be totally tabula rasa. You've never heard of anything. You could basically articulate where it's going. Liberalism has this kind of difficulty here um, in terms of it's not quite clear what it means. So this all comes back to stories and narratives. And if I'm thinking of an advantage the neoliberal paradigm has is that the stories just kind of make sense. So just to like devil's advocate what you're saying, I could think, well, Michael, that's why we expand the pie. That's why we don't think of this as a zero sum game between Jeff Bezos and a middle class person. We give everyone more economic opportunity by cutting regulations, cutting taxes, this, 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 and that. But what do you see as just the straightforward way that progressive, even center left politicians can tell stories in a similarly straightforward way when it comes to just selling these policies? It's a great question, and, it, and it's a tough dilemma, and we see it all the time that democratic messaging, you know, it, it is uh, uh, has challenges. <laughs> let us say that that Republican messaging doesn't, because their their message is very simple and straightforward. You can fit it on a bumper sticker. Uh, the democratic message is more complicated. I try to explain Keynesianism to your average person. I don't think it's impossible. It's just harder. It requires people to follow a few steps. And those steps are basically this. Well, it's like this, my fellow Americans, when the private sector is in a recession or is in trouble and is, doesn't have the money that it normally has to extend credit to small businesses, for example, that's when they have to tighten their belts. But that's exactly when the government should not tighten its belt. 
that's when the government has to step in and provide that credit and provide that money when the private sector can. Hence, a stimulus package like the one Barack Obama passed when the economy was was down on its knees in 2009. I don't know. Did that make sense to you, what I just said now? Is that so hard to explain? Yeah, no, it, it makes the thing that's interesting is <laughs> it's it's a it's a policy story. Yeah. And and the the and once again you're we'll, we'll get into the discussion about freedom but I think something that you, I think you capture well in the book is this idea that there's a value side of, of this part that, that's difficult. I don't know. I guess what I'm thinking about if you're explaining these three different eras so obviously the the Smithian era before the de- depression I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas so I'm going to think of LBJ and and the Hill Country all of your Robert Caro references when he explains and makes the case for FDR when he's running for Congress he says, "Hey, you don't have power." in the hill country the new deal is going to give you power and transform your life like that's a very straightforward yeah. articulation of what new deal keynesian economics looks like and it doesn't require you to have a phd or even let's say a passing familiarity of economics to explain that so here's the real question here how i don't want to be insulting to any politicians here how smart does a politician have to be in the current moment to articulate and push these different bits forward um, as these issues get more and more complicated. Yeah, I I don't think it's that complicated. And by the way, I, I, I don't think that they should lead with this explanation of Keynesianism. That's a little dense for some people probably. But, but just like LBJ said, here's what you say. In the last 50 years in this country, uh, it's been a party for the top 1%. It's time for a party for the middle class. It's time for us to invest in working and middle class people. Uh, that's not complicated. I think most people would like to hear that. Uh, the things that uh, the policies that that fill that picture out are very popular ones. You know, raise the minimum wage, have free or affordable college, um, have paid family leave, have subsidized childcare, um, do things that help people who are struggling to get by. Um, you know, the free market has been great for people who can afford to. You know, go eat at local or restaurants, but it hasn't been great in a lot of small towns in this country where people are free to you know work at the dollar store or go sell a little oxy on the side. That's not freedom. Uh, you know, I think language like that could could work. Where does healthcare fit into this? Because as I'm listing out the policies you were listing is where you make the case here, it seems like I don't want to say healthcare is a distraction, but I'll get into the whole democratic socialism debate from 2016 to 2020. It seems telling that you didn't mention universal health care as one of the offerings for that package. Uh, you know, I just, I don't know, it just didn't pop to mind, but it's obviously very important. It's a, it's a really important part of it. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's a popular thing. Uh, more people agree now that healthcare is a right rather than something that you have to earn, you know, through a good job or something like that. Uh, and health healthcare expansion of healthcare is central to it. I, I, you know, I wish, I wish the Democrats had figured out a way to expand uh, Medicare to include that hearing aid uh, provision and prescription or and uh, and dental. Uh, they couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, I guess the votes aren't there for that yet, uh, let alone something like Medicare for all. So healthcare is a long, long fight. But yeah, it's it's one of the core pillars of this. A question that I'd ask is: Would you? How would you articulate the difference between progressive economics, middle out economics, and democratic socialism as advanced by Bernie Sanders, specifically from 2016 to 2020? I think they're they're all in a similar ballpark. I, I just there are some specific differences, you know. I mean, I think, I mean, to, to talk again about Medicare for all, uh, really, not that many Democrats signed on to Sanders's version of that. It was slightly under half of the House Democratic Caucus, and really only a handful of senators. Um, and actually, some of those senators, I suspect, didn't really believe it, but they just they were running for president and they decided it sounded good. Uh, so, you know, something like Sanders' Medicare for all is is many, many years away from passing. And I myself don't support exactly what what he was proposing. I think I think, you know, the, 
elimination of private insurance. I'm not sure that's a great idea. I mean, even in England and Canada, people could buy supplemental private insurance. And, and in our own country, actual actually existing Medicare, you know, 70 or 75% of Medicare recipients buy supplemental private insurance. So I'm not sure that something like that is ever going to happen. But I, but I can see something that we can uh, fairly call Medicare for all uh uh an expansion of of uh our healthcare system for the elderly uh you know down to people who are 55 or maybe even 50 and older i can i can see that happening in in maybe 15 years time or so um so you know there are those kinds of policy differences uh between the sanders program and um and you know say what biden is is advocating. Uh, but uh, those are differences of degree. The basic thrust is transfer wealth from the top back to the middle. You know, this is interesting. I'd never really thought about it this way. But as you point out in the book, Joe Biden, if he has a central political skill set, it's that he's always been able to find the center of wherever the Democratic Party essentially is. Yeah. So if you think of Joe Biden as this long running creature of Washington who is always with the status quo, which is how you would attack Bernie from the, sorry, how do you attack Biden from the left during the 2020 election? You'd be shocked that we're even having this conversation under Biden. So could you just explain how we should understand Joe Biden? And then we'll get into the Inflation Reduction Act, the American Rescue Plan, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Well, I said all three of those decently. So we'll uh, get into that. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you paraphrase the book fairly and accurately, uh, and um, he was always, he was never a Democratic Leadership Council member. He was never one of those kind of new Democrat people. Can you explain what that was for listeners? Yeah, the Democratic Leadership Council was a group that came into being in the mid-1980s to, uh, quote unquote, modernize the Democratic Party. Uh, and they definitely did make it more corporate friendly uh, and um, and and moved it to the center on economic and cultural issues. Um, and you know, Bill Clinton was was the DLC was a DLC guy. Um, but uh, Biden uh, was never one of those. But he was never you know uh, uh, one of the more progressive ones either. He was always kind of right in between. Uh, and but the center of the gravity in the party has moved to the left in the past decade, and so he has slid to the left as well. And then I think the pandemic was a big factor for him because it it, it exposed and and I quote a, a, a top economic aide to Biden in the book uh, Jared Bernstein. Uh, he said the econo- the pandemic laid bare a lot of the systemic inequities that we've had in this country and just made them more apparent. Uh, you know, the way it hit black and brown people harder, the way that the you know more black and brown people were essential workers who had to get up and go to work while a lot of other people could stay home. And, and the way it hit poor people uh, of all uh, races uh, much harder. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think Biden apparently was just genuinely moved by that and decided that this was a historical occasion that, that he needed to rise to. Uh, I detected, and I think a, a lot of people I talked to did, a big change in his rhetoric from the early part of his campaign when he was essentially saying, uh, if we just get back to the way things were before Trump came along, we'll be fine. And and the way he was talking after the pandemic hit when he was saying, we need much bigger changes. I'm wondering how you think of those three big economic bills that I just mentioned Um that having you know crossed President Biden's desk, it seems if you, if you were to say you know gun to your head, Marshall, you basically do this for a living. Explain these bills. I basically couldn't do it, and I'd say just because this is my pre- my my profession, I'd say I'm in the top, let's say five percent of people who focus on this. So, could you talk about how at a nar- can you talk about at a narrative level? What what through line would you draw would you draw between these three bills, and why is there at least a perception that folks don't really understand what what's in them, despite the fact that trillions of dollars are are being spent? Obviously, uh, very simple through line is just Keynesian public investment again uh, at a level that we haven't done in this country in a long long time. 
um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the American Rescue Plan, in addition to paying people uh, to get through the pandemic, had uh, hundreds of billions of dollars for a whole lot of other purposes. Uh, and and it was just like, you know, the Democrats saw the opportunity to to throw a lot of stuff in there that that had been on their wish list for a long time, and and good stuff, you know, school construction, uh, all kinds of local development things, uh, money for teachers, you know, uh, just lots and lots of different things that weren't necessarily pandemic related per se. Republicans accused them of you know of it all being fat and pork and so forth, but no, it's public investment of the sort that, that you know, a country ought to do. Um, the hard infrastructure bill, uh, you know, I think over the years, people will see the fruits of that, you know, when they're driving around their towns and, or, you know, um, uh, when, you know, with, with hopefully, you know, more uh, modern rail systems around this country and things like that. Uh, and then the most recent one, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, is mostly aimed at climate initiatives. And, and that's another important part of this, to try and make investments that will move us away from a fossil fuel economy toward a greener economy. And you know, showing people that that is not wasteful, that that's not expensive, that that's not you know, crazy socialism, but that that, is, that can actually create jobs and create a better and stronger economy. It's going to take time because it's going to take evidence. But uh, and that evidence can only come over a few years of people seeing what's going on in their communities. But it can happen. It will. Ha it's ha it's happened with Obamacare, which we you know when it passed was at forty two percent in the polls. And now I haven't checked lately, but it's somewhere somewhere in the fifties. And and people like it, and people are using it, uh, and. You know, it'd be, uh, I, uh, God willing, more people could use it, but of course, Republican governors and legislatures have uh, not accepted the, the federal money in so many states. But but many have, many have, and and people are seeing that it's good. So the same thing will happen here, I think. The other big Biden economic move lately was obviously the student uh, debt self loan forgiveness program. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I'm very glad he did it. Um, you know, I. I guess I would have liked the number to be a little higher, uh, but I understand the political um, concerns, uh, and you know it too pulls well. It doesn't pull through the roof by any means. It's not at seventy percent according to the polls I saw. It was about fifty-five or fifty-seven percent. That's that's good enough. You know that means a majority of swing voters are for it. Uh, and, you know, I don't think the Republicans have been very successful in saying, you know, just lazy Harvard kids who drop out, smoke too much dope and drop out. I don't think that's really pushed through. I don't think that that criticism has won the day. I think there are just too many people out there across the country who know people who went to, you know, whatever, the University of Iowa and for their nursing degree and came away with a lot of debt. You know, it's it's. It, it happens all over the country. So uh, I don't think the Republican rhetoric is matching people's reality. I think it's a good start, what Biden did. And uh, and I hope that he or someone can in the future do more. And by the way, just to add really quickly, let's all remember uh, that more than half of young people don't go to college. Um, so I'd like to see the Democratic Party think up something to do for them, too. Okay, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you said that. So I'm sure you've experienced this just in terms of your career um, at Democracy Journal and, and New Republic, this hearing consistent rhetoric over decades, but the conversation never actually shifts. For those, for that huge percentage of young people who don't go to college is the answer that they should go to some form of higher education or is it that there should be alternatives outside the higher education system or like a high school degree should be enough to do this this and that in terms of their uh, middle class aspirations like how should we understand like this side of the argument yeah you know i'm not so expert on on that um to to be able to you know give you some kind of authoritative answer to be perfectly honest with you but 
you know, there are trade schools. Uh, trade schools aren't as expensive as college, obviously, aren't, aren't as expensive as community college, but they can still cost money. Uh, so, you know, that that should be included in in some kind of, you know, student subsidy. Um, you know, more people are going to have to go to college for sure uh, because that's just the nature of the labor market has changed in such a way that, that you know, more jobs are going to require college degrees. But, you know, I still don't think you're going to get to a point in a long, long time where you're going to need or have 60% of the labor force with the college education. I, so, uh, you know, I, I think we still need to think about other ways to give things to young people, uh, you know, like baby bonds is an idea that that a lot of people have. Just a couple of thousand dollars for every baby that's born, uh, a little bit more weighted toward poorer people, and and uh, and that way there's a a nest egg for them when they turn eighteen or twenty one, as as the case may be. There are a lot of ideas out there like that. You know, I wonder this could kind of take us to the to the freedom conversation. So like I've, I've got the total upper middle class background, didn't have to pay for college. I went to like a state school, but you know, even all that stuff. So I am saying this with like that in mind of a frustration I've noted in the higher education discussion is there's a, there's a perception that it's not just the fact that college degrees are expensive, but that it feels arbitrary. Um, there, there, are, there are a lot of jobs that just require a college degree for no particular reason, other than employers like to have a union card to sort folks through. Mm -hmm. So, can you speak to? Can you kind of? Can you kind of speak to? I don't quite know the the right way to phrase this, but it, it almost seems like this meritocracy hangover folks are experiencing because for example when you said the labor market really requires a college degree my immediate thought was like yeah but like how much is that literally true and how much is that like a social construction because like my suspicion is it really leans towards social construction yeah i think you're probably right and um and just politically this is one area where i do think the republicans score points with working class voters uh uh, you know, just the whole panty of Democrats as elitist and they don't care about you. Um, I, I think they scored a lot of points with that. And I think the Democrats, uh, you know, have to do a better job of speaking to people without college degrees and people who live in purple and even red areas and small towns and and convince them that they, that they the Democrats, care about those people. I don't, I don't think they do a very good job of that, by and large. I mean, you know, Tim Ryan is doing that in his race in Ohio. He's a very different kind of sui generis Democrat who's also saying, you know, he votes with Republicans. I mean, he's in it. He know he understands the state that he's running in, and and you know, and so he's saying the things that he has to say. But people like him and Sherrod Brown, uh, also obviously of Ohio, they do at least try in those red parts of their states. Uh, but I think a lot of Democrats don't really do that very much. You know, it's interesting. There's the conventional wisdom that in America, everyone thinks they're middle class. Yeah. I'm not sure that's like true anymore, but we were, we're let's just use the cliche anyways. Um, what would you say is the difference between a working class person in this country and a, a, a solidly middle class person? These terms are sort of interchangeably used, but it seems like they're actually referring to two different sets of economic challenges and even cultural assumptions. Yeah, I think the differences are mostly cultural and, and attitudinal at, at this point, or at least that's the way we think of them when we use them, when we use those terms in politics, right? I mean, a working class person is somebody who doesn't have a college degree and who works at a more blue collar kind of job. And, you know, I don't know. I don't want to lapse into cliches, but, <laughs> you know, beer more than wine and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, Truck over Prius. Yeah. Know, the, the, yeah. The, the cliches. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All those, all those things. And, you know, you, you can see this when you go out into the country and, uh, and you can see the differences. I mean, I grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia, uh, a town of about, I don't know. By now, it's the whole area, 80, 
90,000 people. And then the university is there, another 30,000. So it's not a tiny little town. It's, it's a reasonably sized place. Um, and, uh, and it has a university, as I said. So it has a higher proportion of college graduates than I would imagine many, many towns its size. But you go to the mall and you can just you can see it, you know, in the way people dress and 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 what they drive and and how they talk. You know, you know something I'd love to hear from you on is this. Um, if we're if we're thinking about the the current set of problems facing the country right now, you argue we're entering this new paradigm. During the 1970s, when you went from Keynesianism to, um, let's say, the neoliberal era, there was like a real epicenter for that, and that was California. You obviously have Ronald Reagan; he comes up there as a, as a governor. You have the tax revolts in in the mid to late 1970s. You have like yeah. the shift of Orange County, um, firmly. Um, so this is in you know the greater LA area becoming a firmly Republican area. Where do you see? And then actually, if we go back. FDR, he's governor of New York, and they're trying out all these New Deal programs um, before the actual um, presidency. Is there an epicenter at a state level for these transformations? That's a really interesting question um, that I haven't given enough thought to. Well, first of all, Orange County is shifting back. Yeah, that's the... (laughs) So that's, that's as good a spot as any to identify. I mean, I think that there are uh, I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but there are about seven congressional districts that include some part of Orange County. And I think five or maybe even six of those are Democrats now. Uh, and and uh, several of them uh, Hispanic Democrats. So Orange County is not, you know, it's still called John Wayne Airport, but it's not really John Wayne country anymore. So that's one interesting place. Obviously, every city and university town, I mean, Morgantown is, uh, uh, Biden barely won it, I think. Uh, Obama barely won it, then Romney barely won it, then Trump won it kind of handily against Hillary, and then I think Biden kind of won it. So all university towns, even in the South, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, is pretty purple to blue, Gainesville, Florida, and obviously a place like Ann Arbor. Uh, so it we're dividing like that, mm-hmm. you know, like in 1860, it was very easy to map out what we might today call blue America versus red America. There was a, there was a line right across the middle of the country. But now it's much more complicated. You know, there's this sea of red and there are these blue spots um, but, you know, look at Arizona as a state that may be shifting, maybe going through what Colorado seems already to have gone through uh, over the last 15 years. Um, you know, as, as more and more college educated people become democratic, uh, and that's the state that seems to be with the kind of economy that is drawing those kinds of people and, and may switch uh, from red to blue in a pretty significant way over these next three elections. You know, it's interesting going back to this 1970s example, it really feels as if at least on the short term narrative level, the energy crisis and inflation issues have thrown a wrench in this project. Um, literally like not the, the, I would say the st- stagflation was obviously much worse than what we're experiencing today. The o- OPEC oil boycott was a but much deeper structural problem than whatever is happening, um, you know, in the current energy markets right now. But those were the two specific policy issues that, when combined with the tax revolt, really seemed to create this era of 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 neo of neoliberalism. So I'm curious, how should progressive economists? think of these two issues because the one other thing i'd add to here too is that the story one could have told if if those issues hadn't come up is the larry summers of the world have been have been banished you know they're unlike with obama they're not appointed they're always new progressive econ- econ- economists who are in the white house now but larry summers is having us you know his i guess 15th wind now um because he um highlighted that inflation was going to be a big issue at least at a narrative level early on yeah. was and i'm not an economist so i'm not going to get into the specifics here was kind of let's say ignored 
and now it's here. So he's regained a lot of credibility. So can you just like talk about how with the past, let's say six months have shaped how folks in the progressive economic left are thinking about the political challenges? Excuse me. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm pausing because I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not really sure. And I'm not an economist either, obviously. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, first of all, a lot of economic indicators have been good. You know, inflation obviously steps on that story in the minds <clears throat> of your average person. Uh, and gas prices have gone down. But in July, you know, when it was costing people 70 or 80 dollars to fill their gas tank it's 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 understandable that people have trouble thinking about much of anything else uh but you know unemployment is good job creation is good income growth is pretty good um so uh, and we're back to you know having more jobs than 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 existed uh, before the pandemic uh so there are a lot of good indicators uh uh but you know i think that how should progressive economists think about this? Well, um, you know, or it could be anyone, and you know, because yeah. to, because to, to, we haven't talked about this, but to, to the point of, I think, from my perspective, the point of the book and what's really useful here is there are activists, there are politicians, there are think tanks, there are organizers. There's a whole set of folks who are thinking about this transitional era question, yeah. and it's a legitimate. So, good, good point. It, this isn't per se a question for the activists. This is a question, let me put it this way. If I'm a political organizer and I'm going to meet with um, backbench members of Congress who you want to get behind this package, they could say, look, Michael, I appreciate what you're saying about income inequality, but I have to tell you, the issue my voters are concerned about right now is the price of inf is the price of goods via inflation and the price of a tank of gas. Yeah. What do I say to them? And it doesn't seem to me that right now progressive economics is perfectly optimized to give the political response to that dilemma. Look, there's there's not much you can really say when inflation is high, and whoever is the president is going to get blamed for it, and that president's party is going to get blamed for it. You know, there's not a lot you can say except that you know, a it's. It's not really Joe Biden's fault because it's happening all over the world. You know, inflation in England is higher than it is here. It is receding, so it's going to end. We understand how painful it is for everybody, but you know, it's going to go down. It's going to come to an end. Uh, inflation notwithstanding, we still have an economic job to do, and that's to change the economic priorities of the country so that more money flows to the middle class, so that there's more, there are more supports providing more security for people in the middle class. And that's what middle out means. And it was, Joe Biden uses the phrase all the time. The economy doesn't grow from the top down, it grows from the middle out and the bottom up. And I borrowed it for the title of my book, obviously, but it comes, it was coined in 2011, uh, your listeners might be interested to know, by two friends of mine, uh, Nick Hanauer, a Seattle venture capitalist who was a very progressive guy, and Eric Liu, who had worked uh, as a domestic policy advisor in the Clinton White House and, and uh, is also a very progressive guy. And they used it in exactly the way Biden uses it. The economy doesn't grow from the top down. It grows from the middle out. Create a robust and healthy and secure middle class, and everybody will benefit, the people below and the people above. The people above just won't be having the same kind of party they had from the beginning of the Reagan era, but they'll do fine too. And society as a whole will do better. That's at some fundamental level, Marshall, that's the message. And they just can't deviate from that as a message. And that has to, they have to say that for the next 10 years. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said the 10 years point, because it's kind of the the real rebuttal to my short-termist thinking here when, to your point, it took 10 years, almost exactly for Obamacare, to become a solidified aspect of, of the political structure where it's the first, let's say that Trump or Ron DeSantis becomes president in 2025. Their first task is not going to be repealing Obamacare in a way that 
narratively speaking, that was the idea in 2017. So it's actually helpful to think about when we're talking about these structural issues um, in, in that 10-year time frame. So for the, for the last section of this episode, I'd love to get your thoughts on the rights response to, let's say, this transition out of the neoliberal era. So you have groups like American Compass, or in Cass has come on the the podcast before, you obviously have a lot of the discourse around Trump as a rebuttal to the neoliberal era, especially on issues such as trade. I just love to get your expansive thoughts on that project, both narratively. So for example, you're seeing lots of talk about the GOP has to be more working class oriented and more middle class oriented. There, there are things you've stated in this podcast too, and let's put aside Josh Hawley insurrection things for a second. There are things you've said in this podcast where at least narratively speaking, Josh Hawley would nod and say that's correct. So how much is that narrative versus something serious? We'd love to just hear your expansive thoughts on the Trump era to now. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And uh, I'm I'm a skeptic uh, on how much the Republican Party actually has changed on these things. I also think Donald Trump, except for trade, and except for certain aspects of his rhetoric, is a conventional neoliberal. I mean, he cut taxes for rich people. He cut taxes for corporations. He used to talk in 2016 about he was going to end the carried interest loophole for hedge fund people. Never did it. And that was more Congress's fault than his, but he never pushed it. You know, uh, he talked a lot about infrastructure. That's a Keynesian thing for sure, right? Public investment. He never did it. Infrastructure week became a joke. Also, his education policies, and uh, I want to remind people, public education is a very, very important part of neoliberalism, and I have a section about that in the book, uh, their support for vouchers and charter schools, but especially for vouchers as a panacea, and they haven't been. Uh, they've done a huge voucher program in Milwaukee, Wisconsin public schools for decades. The test scores hasn't made a difference. Uh so privatizing education is a huge part of neoliberalism. And there was never a bigger education privatizer as president than Donald Trump ever and his and his education secretary, Betsy DeVos. So I think Trump is 85 percent conventional neoliberal and a lot of the rest is smoke, uh, except for trade. Josh Hawley's one guy. Marco Rubio is sometimes interested in some of these things. Uh, I still look at the Republican Party and see a party that's still very heavily invested in tax cuts for the rich and and in decreasing res re regulations. I mean, that's what their donors want, and they just do what their donors want. Um, I don't know. Orrin Cass's project is very interesting, and God bless him. Uh, I don't see that thinking having a big foothold among Republican elected officials. I don't know. Yeah, I just saying? I'd say my, yeah I mean I'd say my sub because my my personal story here is that that transformation and that opportunity is what got me into this this set of issues, but what I really saw happen in 2020 that basically leads me to agree with you, um, even assuming good faith from folks that you're that we've mentioned here, is that there's there's another path, and that path is CRT, COVID debates those specific parts because what the GOP has figured out is that you actually can exploit democratic party vulnerabilities with the working and let's say lower middle classes via cultural issues without actually having to let's say get rid of the carried interest loophole change tax policies those different bits like i, I genuinely think what you're going to see happen is you will get the in 2025, let's say Trump or DeSantis wins, you will get the no more Fauci's forever bill combined with a tax cut. Yeah. And just and that's just the reality here. You will get the no more CRT via any school that gets funding from the education department. And, and like, once again, people could hold like complicated views on those two issues. What I'm more speaking about is the, you've, they have just discovered there's like a different path. Um, and if you are a Republican donor, if you're a Republican politician who is already like on the fence around the working class issues, because I think another thing that you've really captured here is I don't think that the, let's say, pro-working class policy Republicans 
economists, activists, organizers, whatever, they haven't actually won the war of ideas. Like at best, they're offering kind of a pragmatic take. They're basically like, Remember during 2013 when like Sean Hannity was on board immigration reform for two seconds because he yeah. was like, oh, crap, we're going to lose. The p- country is changing and we have to get in on this. And the second that it became clear that actually, as long as Donald Trump and a candidate like him opt his working class white vote, they didn't have to go for immigration reform. The party entirely switched. Yeah. I think working class economics is the entire same issue. Any advancement that's happened in the past few years has been purely pragmatic. And as soon as you show that you can have what you've had before without actually having to change your underlying views, you're good to go. And I, I think it's sad, but I think it's, I, I don't see any way around that dynamic. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think obviously, I, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of horrible things about Donald Trump, but I think he's a phony on these other issues too. I mean, his trade, his tariffs, you know, China just retaliated and, 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 and changed its policies. American farmers are, uh, you know, pay, still paying for his tariffs. You know, there are all kinds of studies that, that show this. Uh, you know, he didn't help anybody. You know, uh, it's it's just it's just a joke. It's it's just rhetoric, and and people fall for it. Um, <clears throat> so you know, I don't think I was. Let me put it this way: when I was a young man, I would have had admitted to you readily that conservatives were producing some ideas. Uh, I'm talking about the '80s. I didn't agree with the ideas but I admit that they were ideas. (laughs) I don't think that's really happening very much today. I mean, it's certainly not happening in the party. You know, the party is, is, is the most anti idea uh, political party, you know, in the history of the United States, you know, probably even more than the know nothings uh, of the 1850s. Uh, It's uh, it's shocking what they've become. Then you have your handful of intellectuals, uh, you know, in the Orin cast orbit who are trying, but, you know, they have a long way to go before they penetrate the the hierarchy of that party. I think. I think the thing I'll close on then to get a question from you, I, the, I, the one thing I would defend Trump on really would, I think would just be the, the trade policy, the China aspect of it. I mean, there's a reason why the Biden administration has largely continued that policy. Um, I think the orientation around things like the CHIPS Act is is, is very important. So how, how do you broadly think of, because it it's kind of funny, because if you're thinking about the other side of this neoliberal era, it's really a story of globalization and how the world is inevitably going one direction and the job of the political and economic system is to accommodate those changes. Those changes happen to, let's just say, benefit a very specific set of the income group more than other sets. And that's kind of like the point of this underlying response we're in right now. But it does seem like the broad economic putting aside foreign policy pivot against China and, and globalization is in another is another important story that I think you're going to probably see more more from progressives on. I'd love to hear and close with your thoughts on that part. Yeah, and of course the the Democratic Party under the new Democratic in the new Democratic era uh, embraced that, and and now the through the work of efforts of Sanders and Warren and Sherrod Brown and others, uh, they've said hold on a minute and. Um, and yeah, it's not going to be a free trade party anytime soon. So I, I think, I, and Biden proposes, you know, buy buy American and and all these things. So I think there's a new kind of economic uh, nationalism, I suppose you'd call it, uh, an economic nationalist element to progressive politics, which I think is is good politics. Uh, you know, I'm less qualified to comment on it as economics, but I think it's good economics too if it means American jobs. Um, but you know, it's a piece of, and I guess if we're finishing, I'd just like to finish like this. It's it's an important piece of of a broader economic package that Democrats and progressives have to introduce to the American people. And it's not just, and they can't do it just at the level of talking about specific policies, because people don't listen to that. People listen to ideas and vision. Where do you want to take society? What kind of society do you have in mind, Mr. Democrat, Ms. Democrat? You know, that's what people listen to and respond to. And economics exists on that level, too. As I write in the book, 
it's not just a set of numbers. It's not just the Dow Jones average. It's not just a you know a, a wage number. Economics is a set of ideas about what constitutes a good society, what constitutes a good life, uh, what constitutes a, a a fair and humane uh, and and decent uh, uh, community, and what kinds of economic ideas get us to that place. Uh, so it's not just about lowering prescription drug costs, which is a great thing to do and a necessary thing to do and break the hold of that horrible lobby. Uh, it's about retraining, you know, getting Americans to rethink what economics is about and what it's for. You know, it's not for people to get richer and richer and richer. It's for people to get more, it's for more people to get more secure. The greatest good of the greatest number, as James Madison said. That's an excellent place to leave it. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on The Realignment. And the the book is available in our bookshop where we appreciate folks going first, but obviously Amazon and other retailers are great options too. Once again, Michael, thank you for joining us on the show. It's a great pleasure, Marshall. Thanks for having me. 